Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Richard Shinas. Uh, I'm the Dean of the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and I'm the leader of the Simon Initiative. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to the fourth annual Carnegie Mellon University Simon Initiative Distinguished Lecture. So the initiative is named after the late Herb Simon, um, who won the prestigious Turing Award uh, for his work in computer science and the Nobel Prize in economics but who also did pioneering work in education and educational technology. So sometimes I think we credit Herb with inventing everything that happens at CMU today, not just artificial intelligence and behavioral economics, but he really did come up with the idea of learning engineering more than 50 years ago. As Norm corrected me today, I thought it was only 40, but it's actually 1967. Um, and that's what you're gonna hear a lot about today. So we're particularly excited to have Roar Saxberg here to talk about it because our mission in the Simon Initiative is to make learning engineering a reality at CMU and elsewhere and to do so in a way that demonstrably improves learning outcomes for a wide variety of students. So I'm very excited to introduce you to our distinguished speaker, Broer Saxberg. Broer received a BA in mathematics and a BS in Electrical Engineering from the University of Washington, an MA in Mathematics from Oxford, a PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from MIT, and wait, an MD from Harvard Medical School. And all that was just warm up before he took on the real challenge of his life, education and learning science. So an acknowledged all-star learning scientist, Brewer spent many years at Kaplan as its chief learning officer, where he was responsible for research and applications involving innovative evidence-based learning strategies, technologies, and products across Kaplan's full range of educational offerings. He was also a senior vice president and chief learning officer at the company K-12, where he was responsible for designing both online and offline learning environments and developing new student products and services. Most recently, like just last summer, Brewer joined the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative as the Vice President of Learning Science. He is leading CZI in an effort to apply learning science to real world learning situations across the full span of learning, pre-K, K through 16, and even beyond. So you can see why we're delighted to have him, to come for a day or two, and he is aligned with us in so many ways and aligned with our mission to not just facilitate effective education here at CMU, which is our primary mission, but also to help other institutions who want to use learning engineering to improve their learning outcomes. So one such effort I would like to mention uh, is a collaboration we're engaging in now with nine schools in the Pittsburgh region uh, with the Pittsburgh Council for Higher Education, Peachy for short. So we're actively collaborating with Peachy and I'm delighted to report that almost all of the PG schools were here today. Over a dozen PG reps, including provosts and presidents, uh, uh, were here today, either for the um, lunch with Brewer or in other contexts. So I also would like to say that personally, I got my first real dose of Brewer uh, at the Global Learning Council meetings that were held in Berlin last June. Uh, it was a true pleasure getting to know him, and I can tell you that when a few of us from CMU took Bohr out for a drink after a long day of talks. We instantly became the cool kids at the conference. <laughs> Thanks for that, Bohr, because that rarely happens to nerds like us at CMU. <laughs> and it's my sincere honor to introduce Bohr. Welcome him to the stage for a talk on learning engineering. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's also daunting to be here talking about learning engineering at the place where, you know, the term was arguably coined. My only relief is that Herb Simon is not in the audience. I mean, unless, unless he's managed that uh, trick too, I don't think he's here. Um, but yeah, this, this notion of how do we actually put things together to make real changes in outcomes for students is, has really been my work for the last 20 years or so, and now my work at Chan Zuckerberg. So I'm gonna to try to talk a little bit about that challenge. I'm even gonna talk a little bit about the learning science that applies, 
maybe give some examples of learning engineering, and then uh, seeing how the time goes, I'll talk a little at the end about what my uh, group uh, at uh, Chen Zuckerberg Initiative, the, the learning sciences group, is actually trying to do uh, to make changes in the ecosystem out there. So let's begin. So the first thing in some ways is somewhat simplistic to say, you know, what are we really after here? So imagine this is a, a multi-dimensional bell curve and a high dimensional, no, I won't go there. This is a bell curve. So if, if we're saying this is like people and we're saying, what can we do? Well, we want to do this. Are there any questions now that I've finished my talk? <laughs> uh, okay. okay, a few details to fill in now. You know, there is some, you know, the distance that that bell curve can be moved by effective instruction, you can argue a lot about, but the distance is pretty big when you, if you can apply effective instructional techniques. But the problem is not, do we have effective instructional techniques? The problem is, how do we do this scalably? How do we do this for many, many people? And I don't just mean kids anymore, I mean adults as well, as they're in the workplace. So, how? Well. Again, a relatively uh, simple way of thinking about it is start from how learning actually works. Th it seems like that would be obvious, but there is an awful lot of work that's been done on how we wish learning worked. Aspirational models of learning. You know, children as Rousseauian perfect citizens who are despoiled by, uh, you know, exposure to adults. If we just let them do what they, you know, it doesn't, it's not that simple. Right? Not that simple. So we got to really face up to the fact that sometimes learning is actually pretty dumb. It doesn't work the way we would like it to be designed if we were starting over. But we have to deal with it as it is. And that means we got to know how it is and work from there. And then use technology and implement good solutions. Okay? So a thought experiment. Think for a moment about your worst ever college professor. Okay? You got that person in your mind? Okay. So it used to be that that person could only damage a few thousand minds a year, <laughs> right? Now, thanks to the glories of technology, that person can harm the hopes and dreams of millions of learners in Uzbekistan, you know, overnight. Win for technology, right? No. Technology, in all its uses, it doesn't know about what the good solutions are. What technology does is to take any solution and provide for it to become reliable, available, affordable, data rich. But it does that for bad solutions too. So you got to take the good learning solutions and then use technology to figure out now how do we scale those. And then we really have to use evidence to make progress. And the great thing about some of the technology solutions because um, that's not the complete thing. It's a human technology continuum very likely we're going to need one way or the other. And the technology could be chalkboards, right? But we've got to generate evidence from that and use that to continue to iterate. And yes, that's why I think of what we're doing at CZI and what many of my, your colleagues around here are doing as learning engineering. Because it's this iterative evidence-based approach where you take your best shots, but you don't assume you have it right, and you keep measuring to find out what do we fix next, right? So how do we get there? Well, it feels like we need a kind of a change process to get there, and that's the first part of what I'm gonna share with you, this idea of we need to have some exposure to what actually works, help our colleagues who are doing the work to see there are real opportunities. Then there's some training about how do you systematically do this? So you gotta tempt people and then you gotta really start giving them skills to do this. Then there's a period of just effort. It's just like, okay, now we have to do the heavy lifting. We have to try to get as much of it done as possible. And then finally, there's an evaluation where you're looking to see how we doing and keep iterating and cycling and so forth. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about things in each of those. So in terms of exposure, you really wanna show the science. You want to show even some processes, at least a high level, to show that it can be done this way, and ideally maybe some examples. So let's kind of walk through this. So there's an awful lot known about how expertise works. So I'm going to attempt to give you a ah, four-minute master's degree in cognitive science, which is why I'm really nervous about this, because I'm faced by a row of cognitive scientists here. So it's just like they are going to so school me when I'm done with this. Um, 
And, and part of this is, to me, this is kind of an engineering version, right? So it's how do you describe this in a way that it suggests solutions? So what's come out from 30 or 40 years of work on, on how learning and expertise work is to talk about an information processing model where you have working memory, which is short retention. Um, it benefits from uh, audio and visual channels that if they're aligned together, it can actually work really well together, but can be distracted by it. Um, it is the verbal part. It's where your words in your mind live. So if I start talking in a high squeaky voice and you're thinking he's very strange, that little monologue in your head is really living mostly in working memory. It's slow, it's error prone, but it does also do the hardest problem solving. Now, if we only had working memory, we'd have a lot of trouble because of all those characteristics. But working memory works very closely with long-term memory, which has completely different characteristics. It is very large, it's capacious, it can do many things in parallel. It is nonverbal, which is a real problem because that means it doesn't declare itself. It's the part of your mind that makes things obvious. So why'd you play that chess move? Well, it was obvious. The queen was threat under threat. What does that even mean to somebody who doesn't play chess, right? And, and it's where things go, patterns and processes and all this. In fact, let's try a, let's try a thought experiment. Who here drives a car? Oh, see, I tried this in Singapore. It was a disaster. OK, great. All right, we got car drivers out there. OK, great. Who here has had this experience? You set out for place A. You're thinking about life, the universe, and CMU, and you look up and you're in place B instead. Raise your hand if that's ever happened to you. Raise your hand, see, now look around, look around. You're not crazy, not for that reason anyway, okay, right? So, so the thing we do, and it happens to me all the time, I'm usually under caffeinated and I end up at a Starbucks, right? So, you know, you just you know, drive away and you laugh at yourself, right? But, but think for a second. Who drove you to the wrong place? I mean, you were thinking about life and the universe, the planets, and CMU, not necessarily in that order. And who was in charge of a ton of metal going 30, 40, 70 miles an hour for many minutes at a time? And driving a car is not like digesting a bagel. I mean, I may, I may pay no attention to that either. But this is a decision-making thing. There's people on the roads. There's rules. There's lights. It's like this is a complex cognitive activity about which you had no control at all, apparently. You set the course, you got to thinking, and off it went, right? Well, the research on expertise suggests this is a pattern in lots of expertise, that there are complex, uh, uh, potentially long duration, cognitive processes that are completely automated for experts. Not all things are like that, right? You can plan a summer vacation while driving to work. You cannot plan a summer vacation while writing an IES grant, except, except of course, for you know, Ken Katinger. He can do that. But I mean, for people who are not expert at this, a thing like a writing project is always a collaboration between working memory and long-term memory. And yet, there's a whole bunch of automated things that you draw on, like writing that paragraph or a sentence, getting the punctuation approximately right, evocative language, can all be automated while thinking about your audience and the case and the problem is a really hard, complicated problem that's sitting in working memory. So many things are collaborations between working memory and long-term memory, but you gotta have stuff in long-term memory to achieve expertise. So you guys now know more cognitive science than most developers, many instructional designers, possibly many teachers, administrators, right? Because if you actually took this to heart, you would start to think hard about the design of learning environments. How, what is it that experts have in long-term memory? How do we provide enough practice and feedback to get there? And what is the collaboration that we need here? Right? These should be the kinds of instructional design problems that we're solving, and mostly at scale, we don't. So another area that is actually uh, very important uh, for us is motivation. And we know actually a lot about this. We, when I was at Kaplan, we, we had Richard Clark, who's a very well-known uh, cognitive scientist, do a scan of lots of behavioral economics and social psychology, motivational psychology, cognitive psychology, to look at what goes on with uh, motivation. So you're looking at people getting stuff done, whether it's work results or test results or practice results. You know, People have to engage. And if they're going to do that, they've got to start, persist, and put in mental effort. Right? You know, you, you know, hard things you really have to engage with. So the question is, what gets in the way, what gets in the way of this? So when Dick looked at a lot of literature, he actually came up with a kind of a fun model 
which says there's basically four main categories of things that go wrong. So the first one is you don't value what you're doing. You're a dancer in an algebra class. Why am I here? So I'm thinking about Swan Lake. Well, how do you link to something that would be valuable to a dancer? Is it a, the, the, you know, how you fund a dance foundation over time? Is it discounts? What is it that gets that connection going? Another dancer in that same algebra class might have a different problem, self-efficacy. I'm no good at math, I say to myself. I'm just no good at it. So if the teacher bustles over with the same solution of trying to convince me how important this is for the dance foundation and all this, I'm just feeling increasingly miserable, right? Because yeah, I know my life is over because I can't do it. It's a different problem. It needs a different solution. Something more grounded in problem solving around, yes, you can do math. Everyone can do math. We just have to back up and figure out where the block is, what's the missing pieces. With more effort, we can actually get there and begin going there. The third thing that goes wrong is you blame something else in your environment. You know, my teacher hates me. This textbook, who could learn from this thing? A really popular one among all professionals is I don't have enough time, right? So therefore, I don't start persistent put in mental effort, right? And again, you have to problem solve around that. You have to model it. No, no, we can look at your schedule. We can find a new teacher. We can get a different uh, textbook resource to come after it. But that's different yet again than the other ones. The last one is arguably the hardest. It's negative emotional states. It's where, you know, if you're angry, scared, frightened, depressed, very hard to start persistent put in mental effort. And honestly, you really have to address that when you're dealing with hard things to learn. I mean, it's a, there's a real cognitive psychology, motivational psychology reason for the social services to unlock the uh, ability of, um, uh, of, of people to start persistent and put in mental effort just because of those things. So, and this motivation work, it's, you can embed this in a larger context that we're trying to get out uh, from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is really the whole student development piece. And this is true for adults as well as learners, right? There are, yes, academic issues or work issues, if you like, but these are embedded in a context of social and emotional development, cognitive development at the level of executive function and so forth, identity development, right, as well as physical and mental health. Right? If you are not being fed right, and you have a beautifully designed learning environment by Ken and his colleagues with an excited you know, a teacher ready to motivate you, but you're hungry, right? that's not going to help. Right? So you actually, we all need to be thinking about a multidimensional approach to human development and interventions. Everything you do around a child or an adult for training is going to affect or be affected by all these systems. It would be convenient if we could pull out the math processor and work on it. It doesn't work that way. It's embedded in identity and social and emotional learning and a whole range of things. We can't extirpate these pieces. We have to be aware of them at the same time. So you know, it's, it's known. There's a bunch of research about all this stuff. All of this put together allows for a way to think about learning and, and, and designing the learning. You can start to use techniques like cognitive task analysis to unpack the expertise itself. What is in long-term memory, that the non-conscious things that a mind that's expert is able to do? There are techniques for unpacking that. Then using evidence-based instructional design techniques to actually, and we'll talk a little more about that, you know, apply methods that actually work for different kinds of outcomes better than others. We have to start measuring not just the academic outcomes or work outcomes, but the social and emotional, the identity outcomes as well to see that we're making progress and understand what new interventions we might have to make. And ultimately, especially when we have technology-enhanced solutions, we should become good at iterating, doing pilots rapidly with data that comes off from all of those systems and really uh, you know, improving things as well. So um, if we think about, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the, the cognitive task analysis piece, but if we think about evidence-based instructional design, just a little bit more about learning, one of the ways that learning appears to work is it goes through these stages that at first, when, you're, when you know nothing at all about this, you are kind of in a declarative stage. And it's where working memory is completely overloaded. You have nothing in long-term memory. If any of you remember ever starting to learn to dance, it just feels horrible. Or your first sport, your first time with a, with, with a tennis racket or, 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 a or out on the football field or basketball, there's a great one. Man, it just feels clumsy and horrible. It's because you have nothing in long-term memory to actually help you. 
So what kinds of instructional design elements help you? Well, you try to use the visual field to augment working memory. You use job aids. You make things clear. You break things down so that those initial steps can begin to go, and you begin to put down some traces that go into long-term memory. Once it starts going a little better and you've begun to develop a little bit of expertise, you're kind of in a procedural stage where I can get through this, I can try this, I can attack different problems. And here's where having varied practice tasks starts to be beneficial, where yeah, it's the same basic thing you're trying to do, but hey, a little curveball, or we'll change the, the setup, so that you're practicing in multiple environments. That deepens the expertise, deepens the conceptual underpinnings as you do that. And this is where uh, rich feedback and coaching can be most helpful. In the very start of things, with working memory being flooded, being told a lot of things about how you're doing just kind of bounces off of you, right? Whereas here, you now have more working memory space, potentially to take advantage of the feedback. And ultimately, for some skills or some parts of skills, you can go further, which is to really automate it, to really get it to become a very uh, nearly error-free and, and in long-term memory and something that requires almost no energy to tap. It doesn't. It feels obvious to, to do or to recognize or see, and that requires the repeated uh, frequent practice. So this plays out over the course of a program or even a career. It can take 10 years to get all the way to the full fluencies you want, but you can begin to design early on what are our inputs, how do we bring learners explicitly down this line, how do we tell where they are in all this so that we get the right practice and feedback against them. Some of the research that's out there is, is even more specific. This is, sorry, eye chart. This is from a, a great uh, book, E-Learning in the Science of Instruction by Ruth Clark and Richard Mayer. And it shows a whole set of techniques uh, for, uh, built in part on Rich Mayer's multimedia research that in the laboratory settings, and this is important, it's laboratory settings, can get some pretty good effect sizes. Um, and again, you know, laboratory settings are not live settings. But it's kind of nice to start from things that have some pretty good pushes before you start losing some steam in the real world, world settings. And again, this is CMU, so I probably don't even have to do this, because I know many of you, like I do, have a bell curve in my living room, because at cocktail parties, there's nothing like telling some jokes about, you know, I'm just saying. So, but just, just for a couple of you, um, 50th percentile, move up one whole standard deviation, you're sitting up at the 84th percentile, right? So some of these things here um, in the laboratory, you know, if you can put together graphics and text that are relevant, you can push improvements in learning by quite a lot. Now, context matters tremendously. The controlled context of a basement psychology laboratory is one thing. In the wild, in a, in a school or in a university is another thing. But nonetheless, this suggests there's stuff you can do to try to limit cognitive load and other things in here as well. So, and these are about specific, you know, learning interactions themselves. Um, so, another key piece of this is uh, humility. So, evidence just, it just shows intuitions don't work. So, this is a case study from my days at Kaplan, which I have permission to share. I swear I have permission to share this, okay? So, we are very, they, sorry, they are very good, <laughs> I know, they are very good at uh, LSAT training, the Law School Admissions Test. If any of you have taken it, you may remember one of the hardest parts of the logical reasoning problems. These are these nasty, complex uh, uh, statements with nasty, complex uh, uh, choices that are all logical puzzles, and they're just complete brain benders, right? And it's just really hard. But Kaplan, having done this for a long time, is actually really good at training students for that. So multimedia area comes along. We decided, hey, we're going to make a fabulous multimedia version of it the video version of Kaplan's approach to LSAT logical reasoning problems with a workbook. And they built this, produced it professionally, gorgeous thing. Our job here is done. Uh, one of the people who had been trained in learning engineering, uh, because they hired some random guy who did all this learning engineering work, <clears throat> that would be me, um, he decided to have a look and said, wait a minute, these are really hard, complex problems that overload working memory. I think the work of John Sweller in Australia on worked example actually applies here. Why don't we just show learners some worked out examples where we've put very simple markings on the problems of what an expert, how they analyze it, and we just study a few of these. It should really work. Of course, he was laughed out of the Kaplan test prep. That's ridiculous. Everyone knows video is great. 
But actually, no, he was not laughed out. They said, really? And he said, really? So they said, let's run a randomized controlled trial. And Kaplan, because of its scale, they can run these kinds of trials fairly quickly. So they ran a randomized controlled trial comparing this. On the right is no instruction at all. Just next to it is a bar as a test prep provider you never want to see. <laughs> With the lovingly craft, crafted video plus a workbook, the numbers would suggest learning went down. I'm not the marketing guy, but I think Kaplan, worse than nothing, is not a rallying cry. I mean, <laughs> I, you, some of you may know business more than I do, but I'm just saying, okay? Now, the good news is, when you apply statistics to it, the two bars on the right are statistically the same. My colleagues in marketing say, Kaplan, as good as nothing, still not rocking the house, okay? So this was disturbing, and that was the point, because no one believed that that was gonna be the result. Everyone was sure, compared to nothing, this was gonna be working, did not. The two on the left are statistically the same, we built 15 worked examples, but we didn't know what dosage to give, so we gave eight, we gave 15. Those are actually the same size bar, it turns out, and they're statistically significantly more than either of the ones on the right. Learning science wins, yay. Well, but there's more to this. Look at the number of minutes spent. Almost 100 minutes spent on the video and the workbook. Eight minutes spent on eight worked examples. Lordy. And then finally, those, this was a pilot, right? Those, those eight worked examples, they were eight PowerPoint slides. That was a lovingly crafted half hour video plus an hour long workbook. So the test prep people were just wildly confused. What do we do? What do we do? It works better for students. It takes dramatically less time for students. And it costs hugely less to build. But everyone knows video is great. What do we do? What do we do? Well, they made the right choice. It, one, they recognized they had to do this. But two, they recognized they had to completely change their development process. Because their intuitions literally did not work, caused them to waste student time, and caused them to lose money, waste money. And so they changed their development process so that now learning science comes in right at the front end of the development process to look at each outcome and decide, what do we do with this, and off we go from there. So, but intuitions, you can't rely on those. Okay, the second part of this involves education. How do we actually uh, uh, demonstrate a more detailed process, train some instructional designers, and then basically, uh, you know, get going and, and, and get things out there. So, a first part of this is, you know, to do this, it does require training. You can't just hand these people reprints and just have them get going. And part of this is, this kind of research and this kind of approach, it needs you to think about backwards design, right? Where you have to start from the learning outcomes, work your way backwards to design this thing. Because if you start the way most of us who lecture do, we might start from what I want to say, and then later kind of graft on, I hope they got this stuff out of it. And that's how I did this. <clears throat> no, anyway, so, yeah. <laughs> and, what needs to happen is what are the outcomes you want people to have and then work backwards to figure out how do you tell what therefore is the practice and feedback and so forth and then you deliver in the same way going forward. You deliver going forward. So uh, lots of things are needed for this. One is how do you help people even wrap their minds around this rich literature? So one of the things that we did was we actually made use of the uh, KLI framework that Ken and his colleagues have worked on here at Carnegie Mellon and we simplified it into a, a, a simple matrix that we then used to train all the instructional designers at Kaplan. So it begins at the top level. And this, by the way, it's kind of a replacement for a, a Bloom's uh, taxonomy. Do you guys know Bloom's? Who here knows Bloom's? Lots of people have heard of Bloom's, okay? My good colleague Brenda Sue grew once did a conference session basically called Why is Bloom's Dead? No, she didn't do that, but it was close enough. That was the, that was the content of it. And, and Bloom's was kind of like an Aristotelian thought experiment around physics, but it was around instructional design where they had no evidence, but they kind of imagined how they thought outcomes should be classified, and fine. But Ken and colleagues said, wait, we actually know some things about this. Why don't we try to rework a framework of types of outcomes and types of interactions based on that? So it begins at the top level. 
that you're really looking for complex cognitive procedures of various kinds in the domain. And it could be something like, you know, can write a, a one-page summary of a 10-page piece or something like that, right? These are complex cognitive things. And so how do you do that? Well, you've you got to practice when to use the complex cognitive procedure, and you've got to go through the steps. You've got to actually do it. I mean, that, and people sometimes forget that when they're doing instruction, that you have to come back to what's the real thing you want students to be able to decide and do. But that gets made up of a lot of other things. So there are facts. And you know, the facts are the little instantaneous nuggets. And there are ways from the research world about how to do that better. Spaced repetition, uh, uh, learning them in the context of work to actually cement them with the context. There's ways to do this better out of the research literature. Similarly, concepts, different than facts. Concepts in an expert mind are designed to pull up frameworks of problem solving that match a situation. So the, the classic is Chi and Glazer's physics work looking at uh, uh, you know, motion problems and, and you know, Newton problem, Newton's law problems, uh, rolling planes, inclined planes, springs. Some of you are getting hives now when you think about your high school physics days, right? So uh, the best physics problem solvers immediately classify it as a momentum problem or an energy problem. And they might look almost identical. The graphic might be the same, but the question changes it from a momentum problem to an energy problem. So it can be subtle. But if you can get that right, then the frameworks tell you what's important, and the whole thing decomposes very quickly, and it simplifies extraordinarily what you have to do. So you know, the concepts are used to classify. So the training for this doesn't have to be solve lots of problems. It can be classify lots of problems, figure out, you know, and maybe identity, you know, identify or generate examples and non-examples, right? So it's really looking at the features of the concept itself. There's also processes, you know, like Krebs cycle or an engine, things like that. They have inputs and outputs of various stages. And again, the goal is not to just memorize that. The goal is to be able to quickly predict, if I change inputs, what will my outputs be? And experts are really good at that. They snap that up. That's fast. It's harder, but the other side, if I have a, a yucky output, what could have gone wrong? And so again, that's a thing that experts get really good at doing. And so again, practice for those kinds of things. And then finally, this is you know, uh, the, when you have a foggy, difficult problem, one of the things that experts can do is get started. I don't know what's going on, but the first thing we're going to do is uh, uh, whatever it is. And the interesting thing is, when you study experts, those can be often summarized in like a few sentences. But of course, memorizing the sentences doesn't, isn't the thing. The thing is the application in a foggy context. So that's the practice and feedback you need. But like I say, these are all supporting of the big procedure up there. So you have to make sure you're doing that. And these things are, some of these things can be embedded in long-term memory, but most of them are these uh, you know, collaborations between working memory and long-term memory. So you know, if you want to get instructional designers to actually be able to do that, it's real work. So again, at Kaplan as an example, they actually built a pretty extensive training program, pr training program for this. It involved a 40-hour online training program that, that instructional designers who wanted to get up to speed on this would go through. Then there was a two-day in-person workshop where they were assembled into teams of two to four instructional designers working on problems that were valuable to them, so from their domain. But they were small problems, small learning problems. And then from that, it extended to a, a coached long-term product development problem using evidence-based methods coached by a good evidence-based instructional designer. It, and you know, this seems crazy expensive and extensive. There is research that shows that teachers and instructional designers have brains. Now, I can give you guys references afterwards if you need that, but I'm just saying, okay, trust me on this. And therefore, all the learning theory that applies to their students applies to them as well. And I include motivation in that. For many universities, when you're trying to implement you know, uh, new, new ideas in instruction, you've got to figure out how to convince some faculty why is this valuable. Some faculty, you're going to have to convince that they can do it. Because, oh my god, I can't do that. It looks horrible. And some faculty you know, are just going to say, I don't have time to do this. right? So it's very much the same kind of thing for instructional designers and faculty, both on the cognitive and on the non-cognitive non side. So, that's the education piece. Um, let's talk about then effort. How do you start adding more effort, getting people going in a big way? So 
One of the things is to actually have a look, do a scan of what you, what you have to see how big a problem you have is across the board. This was done at Kaplan a, a number of years ago now. They looked at nine of their largest international products against a checklist that I'll show you a little bit later on in more detail. And what you can see here is the light, the light colors mean low. This is a, pretty much a checkerboard. And they'd never done this before, so this is the first time. And the interesting thing from an engineering standpoint is some of this it's OK that it wasn't done well. So like um, uh, some of the work maybe on personalization, that can be really expensive to do, multiple versions and assessments. So it's not the first thing to do. But there were three of them that didn't really have objectives. What the heck is that? I mean, objectives are like a sentence. That wasn't a giant multimedia burden. That was like, you don't even know what you're teaching? Well, I teach what I teach. Aye, you know? And assessment as well. Look at how light the assessment side is. Again, that's a little worrying, right? So this created some energy to say, whoa, OK, we're not where we thought we were, right? We're not where we thought we were. And that began then a whole process of going after it. So we began doing some pilots and things. So we took, an, um, as, as an ex example, kind of an experiment, a pilot to show we can make a difference. We took a fairly standard online approach to course development, which is kind of a read, write, discuss model where you know, people kind of wrote it and then figured out the outcomes after the fact. And there weren't too many demonstrations and worked examples because it was mostly read the book and write a, you know, a heavy use of the uh, online discussion boards as if that was the right practice for these kinds of things. And we threw the cognitive science kitchen sink at it. Right? We completely redesigned them. So we had one lesson per outcome. We had motivational supports. We did put in the demonstrations that worked examples. We provided very detailed scoring guides, not generic rubrics, but very detailed scoring guides, a bunch of things like this. And then we ran a randomized control trial experiment to see if we modified three uh, online courses this way to see what we would get. And what we got, and we reported this at AERA, I think, is compared to the control courses, we had a significant increase in the success of students. And success was defined as uh, 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 past the course, um, uh, actually uh, 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 past the main outcomes of the course, because that's a different thing. One is just you know, the, doing all the work. But the second one is you actually mastered the key outcomes. And the third was you came back. You came back. That's a success, right? And so we had big increases, 28% increase in, the, uh, in success. Uh, students were 1.6 times more likely to be successful. So again, this really caught the attention of the Kaplan University group. And, and so one of the things that they then did out of that was to recognize they had some courses where they would have 1,000 students per month beginning the course. Because you know 12,000 students a year in some of these introductory things. And because it was a virtual university, they could start them every month. So you start to work it out. You say, all right, 1,000 students split them up into you know, uh, five sets here of 200 students each. Well, all of a sudden, you know, you got eight sections of 25 students that you could be running pilots on, right? So each of those could become a pilot. And then you do it again and again. And if you're nimble, you come back to the first set of pilots you were doing and redo them you know, with improvements. And again and again. And oh, one course, if you were really cooking with gas, you should be able to get 50 randomized controlled trials done in a year, 50. So this is how Google does it. This is how, uh, what's that place called? Uh, Facebook. Yeah. This is what, yes, yeah, CZI, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, never mind. All right, so this is, this is how, uh, this is how Facebook does it. This is how Amazon does it, right? They're not doing it to publish papers. The controlled trials are an engineering technique. Right? That's the point here, is you can use this for engineering purposes when you have scale and technology-enhanced education that you can sort of time shift. So they got interested in all kinds of topics, motivation, social norming, worked examples, uh, learning strategies, uh, changing the assessments. Suddenly, you could have a whole uh, array of projects you're after when just one course gives you dozens of opportunities. Right? So this is pretty exciting stuff. So, Another piece of this, though, which we realized, and it was actually our chief financial officer who po pointed this out. Think of that. The CFO at Kaplan was thinking hard about learning. This is really cool when you get to that stage. Um, he said, we're never going to make this place into a learning engineering organization if we do not get the general managers to understand enough about this to be dangerous, because they're the guys who allocate resources. They're the guys with the money. 
So if all we do is train the instructional designers, the general managers will mess it up because they won't see the importance. So we began a whole process of actually interrogating and talking with the general managers twice a year about learning challenges, learning designs, learning investments, uh, and their assessment work. The first one that we did was about the learning, the basics of the learning stuff. The second one was on pilots they were planning to do. And the third one was more about, now you've got all this data that you're delivering, how are you going to process it and analyze it? And it turned out this was a total cheat here, right? Because again, again there's research, even general managers have brains. Okay, I know, I know, this is where I get a little bit out of my, you know, I gotta be careful, but they do. Which means the fact that every six months they had to spend an hour with the global CEO talking about learning using the language we've been using for the last 20 minutes meant the frameworks were getting embedded in their spinal cords without them even realizing it. I'm a very bad man, <laughs> all right? And so that was the point, is to get them now familiar. And now they began to ask their instructional designers. It became natural to talk about this. And they've continued this even after I've left, actually, which is kind of cool. So the last piece is then potentially evaluation. So one of this, part of this, and I showed a little bit earlier uh, 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 an evaluation scheme. These are the different areas on that evaluation scheme. And actually, my, my good colleague, uh, Katrina Stevens, actually brought this evaluation tool into the uh, US Department of Education EdTech Developer's Guide. So you can actually, it's a public thing now if you want to look at it. Um, and you know, it's not just these. Each of these has its own set of simple but tied to some learning science uh, attributes. And so here are some about the objectives and the assessment. There's coherence here that you know you got to have the assessments match the objectives. The practice has to match the assessments. There's also things about feedback, which has a huge amount of, of data about how valuable it is. So you know this is a learning science grounded but still simple checklist. And of course you have to be careful. Checklists are checklists, right? That I once thought it would be fun to do an experiment where I would build a course that met every one of these things, but was a complete disaster, because it was totally incoherent to human beings. And I know I can do this, I just haven't at the time. Because checklists are checklists, right? The point is, if you have a well-designed course, it should hit a lot of these things, but it, this isn't, it's, you know, it's not sufficient to just hit these things. But it also has other things besides those first simple things. It has some more complicated things like the organization, motivation, et cetera. So you want some way to evaluate systematically the progress of what's going on. You also look backwards. So this is, uh, after the first couple of years of doing these randomized controlled trials at Kaplan University, they had something like 130 of these, which they then analyzed to see how we doing. And it actually looks like an innovation pipeline that you know, the ones on the left are the ones that came out definitely positive. And you can see the areas that they were investigating. The, the big bar in the middle, uh, in the two one on the right there, it's what you might think. It's like inconclusive. We don't know yet. We're not quite done, but we don't know. So that's like normal innovation pipelines kind of look that way. And then there's a bunch that are, uh, there are several there, uh, just to the left of the big red bar, that are like, don't do this. We have the evidence and it says, don't do this. And people don't like to publish negative results. But if you're actually working with learners, you want to know what not to do uh, because you're going to waste everybody's time and effort uh, you know, doing those things. So you're going to get things that actually look like innovation pipelines. And you should analyze that to see, is this about what we should be doing? Are we going after the right categories and so forth? And indeed, you can do some pretty sophisticated statistical work as well where on the items you're using, the assessments you're using, this is from uh, Kaplan Test Prep. This is a financial services exam. And they, they did item difficulty and item discrimination analysis, which are basic classic test theory stuff. And it had never been done before. And they found all kinds of problems. They found some items that were negatively correlated with performance. If you got them right, that probably meant you were not understanding what was going on. Wait a minute. Something's wrong with this picture, right? Some of the items are too hard. Some are way too easy. This isn't that hard to do once you have the data. You just have to do it, and then you go dig at all the red ones. Right? So again, that's just blocking and tackling. So um, OK, I think I have enough time to do this. I'm going to describe to you, given all of this, what is it that we think at, in the CZI Learning Sciences that we might be able to pull off to be helpful? How can we assist in this complex enterprise of getting more evidence and learning science used at scale? So here's what we think we're trying to do. 
if you think about how this ought to be working, it's kind of like a cycle here where you got research, feeding, the uh, commercialization, feeding deployment, feeding usage, back around and around and around. This is how many of these industry ecosystems actually work. Uh, ours is a little broken, so we want to do some work on that. But the kinds of things that, as we think about this, that we think our group can help with, a first key missing element is the learning measures. And it's not just academic measures, it's actually the measures of non-academic performance that are not out there in a way that's scalable, repeatable, reliable, and so forth. Even the constructs for some of those issues in social and emotional learning uh, and identity are not well defined. But if we can get those, that becomes tools that the whole industry then can start to use to figure out how are they doing. A second piece of this is tied to the ecosystem itself, things like how can we help increase the demand for better learning and better learning measures? The funny thing is, you know, people are not angry about the garbage they're being asked to buy, right? They have these terrible learning environments and, you know, things that have never been tested that have just changed colors and they're expected to buy them again. And it is the case, they don't have a choice, right? But what's interesting is nobody is angry at the sales reps. Now, I happen to know from having been in a for profit company, if a sales rep comes back, got the sale, and the sales rep got his head handed to him, that is not a good day for the sales rep. Sales reps, kind of by nature, insecure, a little nervous, they, are not ha they think they're gonna lose the sale next year. So they start to make things happen. They got the sale, but they had people yelling at him about how awful this was, and how if anybody brings me something with these following characteristics, I'm moving away from this, blah, 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 blah. So I was laughing with Ken earlier today. You know, we know how to do anger management, Maybe we need to do anger enhancement. What do you think, huh? No, no that's, not in our, that's not in our product portfolio. Don't worry, don't worry. But, but the basic idea is we gotta get some demand up. We also need more people who can do learning measures and learning engineering. So we're gonna think about how do we increase the pipeline? Can we fund some positions there as well? Another piece of this is, and that's part of what we've been talking here with your colleagues about, is clusters that are iterative, collaborative, evidence-based that combine problems of practice, teachers, students at scale, with researchers and developers, and they begin to do these kinds of cycles in a regular way. So we wanna see how can we stimulate some of those to get going and learn what makes them work, because there's like none of those right now in the education ecosystem. What can we do with this? Um, and then the last one is uh, basically something like a, a deep R&D directed development effort. DARPA, for example, has done this for the Defense Department for many years where they take a really hard problem, they crush together a multi-dimension or multi-industry uh, uh, consortium of maybe unusual partners, and they get them to go with substantial resources. They try to get 20 years of development done in five, right? And that's worked really well for the last 40 or 50 years that DARPA has been doing this stuff. So we're thinking with some of our other colleagues at Gates and maybe elsewhere, maybe it's time to think about an ARPA for education. So we're gonna think hard about, can we figure out how to pick some problems, get some organizations together, and go after something really hard um, that, that, that would be really aspirational. And so we think if we do all of these kinds of things, we're really starting to push the ecosystem and make it more possible for more folks to do the learning engineering work that we think is needed out there, and that the time has come with technology-enhanced learning, the increasing amount of evidence and data being thrown off by all these systems, uh, the learning analytics work that people know how to do, and the advances in learning science that can now be applied with the right technology to solve problems, uh, you know, I think the chances for accelerating learning uh, and making it more reliably successful are higher than they've really ever been. So thank you very much for your uh, time and attention. Uh, you talked a lot about finding a proper balance between just a lot of different variables, you know, a problem being too hard or a problem being too easy. Um, and then when you mentioned that cycle about commercializing and all of that, 
Do you feel that profit for such a large company um, affects how quickly you can roll out changes? And because I, I understand that having more money will help you produce, you know, better, better, you know, learning environments more quickly. But is there also a point where research is slowed down because of the fact that you can just keep selling sm smaller changes? So. I think this is why uh, the demand side of this is so important, is um, uh, as markets demonstrate that they care a lot about evidence-based learning and the underpinnings of learning in this way, that will start to shift what companies think they need to invest in. Right now, and I know this, venture capitalists will tell their little entrepreneurial startups, don't invest a dollar of my money in efficacy studies. Because nobody is buying based on efficacy. And you know, I am a startup king. I know what to do. We are going to invest in the things that matter to this market. And so it's when the market starts to say, I want this. This is what I really want, that then you start to get real progress, I think, uh, against these kinds of things. And there are some visionary companies, and actually several of them. I mean, Pearson was doing a lot of work on efficacy. I'm not sure how much they're doing now. But they were really pressing on this for quite a few years. Um, wanting to measure it and figure it out and do that internally. Uh, uh, Kaplan, as I mentioned, uh, is still and has spent now eight, nine years doing this work, is very intentionally trying to do it. But that is unusual. That requires really visionary management. And to be honest, I don't know about Pearson, but at Kaplan, the reason was that Andy Rosen, the CEO who hired me and is still there, he and the board of directors could see that, OK, I'll, I'll put it this way. It used to be you had to pay to get a bad education. Now, a bad education is free. You can go online and get really bad videos and you know, terrible courses from all kinds of vendors, right? But you don't have to pay for that anymore. So if you are in the market of charging for bad education, the dead hand of Keynes is going to crush you. It could take five years. It could take 10 years. This, 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 the market forces take time. But you're dead. So Kaplan said, we are not going to die. We're going to get ahead of demand. We're going to be in the place that has evidence and that's better at moving people to expertise and identifying expertise. And so we will not be the ones crushed as the slow progress of free keeps going up. And we need to have more demand that validates that to get more companies and suppliers and just excited developers to keep going down that direction. So that was a long answer to a short question, but uh, another question. Mike is incoming. Uh, so most of the studies that uh, we talked about here are very short-term studies. Like you talked about having 50 studies over a period of one year. But as we know, societies and humans adapt to whatever is thrown at them. And given that uh, the free stuff online is increasing, don't you think humans would adapt to that kind of content? And rather than trying to uh, cater to cater your product to what humans like right now or hu humans are more comfortable with right now, shouldn't we be predicting, based on the free stuff that's increasing, this is how humans would be learning two years down the line? So there's several things, I think, wrapped up in that question that are actually pretty interesting. One is, our learning machinery is not different than it was 50,000 years ago or so. That the, the, the way learning works, the way expertise works, the how long-term memory and other things all tie together, the amount of practice and feedback required, that isn't changing. So that system is still working the way it does. Second thing is, there's plenty of evidence that what people like to do for learning doesn't necessarily link up with what works best for their learning, which is really irritating when you're out there trying to sell learning because you, some things are just hard to learn. You know, learning to write well for almost all people is a lot of practice and feedback. And it's hard. And there's just work. And it's working memory burdens all the time. And you get tired, right? So wonderful if there was a pill. As far as people know, there isn't one. So we have to figure out how to help folks recognize no pain, no gain. And we've done this before. I mean, like that just phrase I just gave you. People know, hey, I got to sweat. I, I got to work to exercise, build my muscles, right? So we have some cultural ground to cover to try to get people to recognize what's needed for mastery, what's the work that's actually needed, as opposed to thinking, if this is hard for me, I shouldn't be doing it. 
I mean, that's directly opposite from what the learning work says about when are you optimally learning, right? So there's a bunch of things that are in the way. I do think we need to think about, yes, where is the puck going in terms of what learning facilities will become available and trying to build on top of those. So one of the things we're trying to do within our work is look ahead. So if we're building better learning measures now for, let's say, identity or, or, or social and emotional learning, and we know they're going to be in existence two years from now, and we're also working on some learning engineering projects, we want to make sure that folks are aware, hey, we might have some better measures of these other things in two years' time, so let's leave space for that. So we're going to want to be thinking about you know, where is the puck going along those lines. The last piece is it's hard to do, but really important to do, longitudinal work that stretches out over years. And there have been studies like that that uh, can show some very uh, amazing things. There was like a 10-year study of students in uh, oh, West Virginia, maybe? No, Tennessee, I think it was, that looked at the impact of having a, a top quartile fourth grade teacher versus a bottom quartile fourth grade teacher from a test score standpoint, right? Which, you know, uh, test scores, oh, who knows? But they were able to show that 10 years later, the income distributions were significantly different. And it meant that you know, the top quartile teachers were worth like a quarter of a million dollars more in terms of the net present value of the additional income. And that was without even trying. Right? That was just statistics, just random. Right? And it was the impact of one year fourth grade teachers. Right? So we know there are some tremendous longitudinal impacts. Similarly, at the earliest grade levels, and uh, you give me an excuse to mention something that we just announced yesterday, which is a quite large study with the Harvard Graduate School of Education and MIT uh, on uh, language learning, where we're going to work with MIT uh, and Harvard Graduate School of Education on a screener that can be used in pre-K or kindergarten, grounded in cognitive neuroscience scans of little children's brains, and looking at correlations between those scans and activities that link to those scans with uh, reading problems two or three years later. And the idea is instead of waiting for the reading problems to appear in two or three years later, which is how it works now, and then you do response to intervention, if we can find things that are reliably predictive of that, let's start the interventions in kindergarten. But that relies on three-year data sets and patience to then do the experiment and then see if we'd made the difference two or three years later. Right? So there's a bunch of things like that about patience and investment that we're going to have to do. So there, it, thank you for the question. There was a lot of complexity to that. We have time for one more question. Go for it. Um, so on the, side, uh, the question of sort of increasing um, demand for evidence and uh, given the broad remit of sort of the scope of education you guys are thinking about at Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, how do you think about the issue where um, education frequently feels very localized to whoever is the consumer of that education or the instructor of that education? So if, I'm, if you tell me that you ran a great study in English, I'll tell you I'm a math teacher. If it's in high school, I'll tell you I teach middle school and so on. It's, I, I think, it's, I mean, this is one of the complexities. Context matters, but I think part of the uh, infrastructure of understanding how learning works better is to try to come up with what are the real things about a mind that matter. So for example now there's a lot of work showing demographic issues around learning, right? That you can use demographics and uh, parents uh, uh, education levels and all kinds of things to do all these predictive things around how students will do and who's at risk. And that's valuable work. But you can ask, okay, wait a minute, what, what is happening in the kid's mind? Right? What about the mind is going on as a result of having grown up with parents that have certain social characteristics, right? And because that's really about learning, right? So if we could understand what are the characteristics of a mind and measure that directly, we wouldn't have to be so indirect and in some cases unfair about using you know, noisier demographics. I'll give you an example from healthcare. Um, so, uh, lead, lead poisoning is very much correlated with zip codes. Right? You can see certain zip codes, Aye, this is horrible, right? So one solution is let's treat the zip codes, right? We'll pick a level and you're in that zip code, so everyone in that zip code gets treated for lead poisoning. How about another idea? Why don't we treat everyone who has lead poisoning? <laughs> huh? Huh? Innovation? Huh? Because if you actually have a probe of lead poisoning itself, then the fact that the, you know, the zip codes are correlated, that's for, uh, you can take other actions and all this, but in terms of helping this child, well, even if I'm in a low incidence place, if I've got lead poisoning, I should be treated. 
So if we can find measures that are closer to what's going on in that mind, and then use those to personalize the learning, to alter what the learning environment is, that would be great. And then the interesting dynamic between teachers, too, and learners. And so then there's characteristics of teachers as well. And again, how can we understand more about teachers and their identity, their motivation, and all that, and begin to then do those combination things? It's complex stuff, a really good question. Um, but the thing we cannot do is ignore the context. That's clear. Over and over again, people take a solution from one environment, drop it into a different environment without looking at that, and then wonder why it doesn't work. Where you really need to find environments that are close and students that are close to your kids. And the key thing is, how do we define close? How can we do that in a multidimensional way with better measures of you know, non-academic as well as academic measures? So, so thank you all very much for your time, and I'll be around. So.